Welcome to Prairie Lake Church. I'm excited to be here this weekend. How about you? All right. As, as uh, you are probably understanding, I'm Kyle. I'm the Fort Dodge campus pastor and just pumped up to be here this weekend with you. Before I give you a brief update about what's going on in Fort Dodge, I just want us to make sure we do the thing we always do around here at PLC. Let's welcome in all of our online attenders and our various campuses across the state. And uh, let's make sure we also get our Bibles out. So go ahead and, and get those out, locate it. Uh, if you're using your phone, make sure you get it out. Uh, and we just, we desire that you check along with us. We know that as we get the word this morning. God might take you on a journey that's further than where I had intended to take you, or he might just want to, to hold you up in one specific spot. So we encourage you to get those out this morning. Also, as you're doing that, make sure you get your hands up. If you don't have a pen this morning, the ushers will make sure you get one. Uh, and as you're doing that, I encourage you to get your bulletin out. Uh, I'm going to have three lessons that we're going to learn from Jesus this weekend as we wrap up this big Iowa, little Iowa sermon series uh, about learning, including, and blessing. And Pastor John uh, taught us... Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, time out. I'm going to give you the Fort Dodge update first. All right, redo. So, so awesome things are happening. I want to just give you three big bullet points of what's going on in Fort Dodge. Really cool things. The first of which is a location. God has opened up an opportunity, a sweet place for us that's located between uh, Highway 169 and Business 20 that comes right out of town, uh, comes right through the heart of town, and you go east or west on it. And, and there is a campus out there that is, is screaming for us to be able to purchase it. It meets the needs that we have to be able to do ministry. It's right on the south side of Iowa Central Community College, which is awesome and perfect for us uh, to be able to partner with the college. So great location that we're very thrilled and privileged uh, to be able to, to celebrate with them. The other thing uh, about that location is it is really, it's, it's primarily turnkey. And so we get to come in and we get to uh, inherit a building that is, is uh, greatly established and we get to come in 24-7 uh, and be able to do ministry, uh, offices and all. And that is just great. And so here's what we need from you. Number one, I want to say thank you uh, for the generosity across our campuses, uh, the campaign, uh, a better story. Uh, we, we have been able to raise enough money. It's, it's prepared for us to be able to make this happen. But what we need on top of that, uh, thanks that I want to give you. I just want to remind you, uh, we need continued prayer and affirmation that this is the building for us. So what's that mean? If you are a member of Prairie Lake Church, we need you to vote, to affirm that this is where we need to be going, and this is what we need to be doing. In addition to us doing that, they are also doing the same thing, the current owners of that facility. And so God is partnering two ministries. The neat thing for us with them, that church isn't closing down. There's plenty of other ministry to do in Fort Dodge. That's why we're going. We understand that. But that church isn't closing down. They're going portable. And so they're going to be uh, leasing a facility on the campus. And so it's cool. They're not, they're not closing shop. And so they're going to be voting for that as well. So just pray for that affirmation. If you're a member, please vote. We need you to do that September 7th. They're voting September 15th. All right. One other, a uh, couple other bullet points. Staff. We have all of our staff hired. As of Wednesday, we completed. We have an admin slash first impressions coordinator. That was our last position. And that is worth applauding for because we are all there and it is time to happen. All right? Very cool. Very cool. We are super pumped up about that. And I just can't express enough thanks for, for your prayers and your generosity. I want to continue. Uh, hopefully, you can continue to hear. Uh, check us out on our blog. We're going to be publicizing lots of information. But the last bullet point that I want to make sure you understand before we dig into the recap of this sermon series is simply this. Neatest uh, launch opportunity that, that I could think about as we brainstormed how this was going to work out, December 24th. That is our launch date. Uh, we get a chance to soft launch starting at the beginning of December, and we get a chance to open our doors and reach out to the community fully December 24th. So put that on your calendar. Be praying about that date. A very unique opportunity to launch Christmas Eve, and we're super excited about it. There's great joy uh, and responsibility that comes with that, and we are pumped up about that. So that's what's happening in Fort Dodge, and I hope that excites you as much as I'm excited about it, and we're just uh, very privileged to be there uh, as Prairie Lakes doing that, that ministry. All right. This weekend, we are concluding our Big Iowa, Little Iowa sermon series. Pastor John, the first week, taught us about learn and reminded us about this learn. And that is, is spending time with God uh, to become more like Jesus. And then we jumped ahead to the, the third rhythm that we talk about, blessing. And he taught about that last weekend, demonstrating uh, God's love to others with no strings attached. 
This weekend, we're going to talk about include, and, and that's inviting other people into our lives so that they can see my life, so that they can see Jesus at work in me. And, and I have to be honest with you, when I think about these three rhythms that Jesus models oh so well, and he asks us, if we're going to be disciples, if, if, if we want to make it nearly impossible for people in the state of Iowa as disciples of Jesus Christ, our responsibility, if we want to make it nearly impossible for them to go to hell, as we live these rhythms out, this one today that I'm going to teach to you about becomes the most intimidating for me personally. Because it's the place that we become the most vulnerable. We open our lives up. The, 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 the privilege to open our lives up can be a little scary when God says, hey, my son did this for you, now I want you to do this for other people, we get the opportunity, which can be scary, to be able to say not just, hey, I want you to see the joys that are happening in my life and the victories that are happening in my life, but, but sometimes in order to see those joys and victories, you've got to see the mess. You've got to see where I've been. You've got to see what I've been doing. But in the end, you get a chance to meet my king. And it's worth it. And so sometimes it's a little intimidating. But let's make sure we put ourselves all on the same playing field this morning. We've all been there. We've all been in, in both of these camps. We've all been in the place where we haven't been included. We've all wondered, why me? What's going on? What's wrong with me? Who am I? What is the scenario here? We've all been there. Sometimes it's been in our youth. But I think that carries over. There's even been times as adults, we wonder why we didn't get the phone call. What happened? And then there's times, even it doesn't matter how many times we haven't been included, there's just probably as many times where we haven't included. We've all been in both camps. So the playing field, we're all on the same spot this morning as we go into this uh, situation and study these lessons from Jesus. Before we go anywhere, I want to I wanna take you to a place. I'd encourage you to write down 1 John 2, 6. For those who claim to know him, live as Jesus lived. Live as Jesus did, depending on what translation you're in. Live as Jesus did. That's pretty intimidating. Like, like the, the idea of including people in my life, it, when, when we look at that truth, it can kind of intimidate us a little bit. Like, that, that's a pretty high bar, Jesus. But one of the things that we can do right off the bat is we can say, thank you for not leaving us without an example. Thank you for not setting that bar so high and, and making it impossible for me to reach. Because you gave me examples. And those examples we're going to look at this morning, we're going to look at three ways, three lessons that we can learn from Jesus if we're going to apply what this including rhythm looks like in our lives as, as, as we cross lines, as we invite people into our homes, as we invite people into our lives, into our cars, into our conversations, and we include them so that they can get a chance to see how Jesus can take a knucklehead like me and enable me to understand the riches of his love. So this morning, the first place that we're going to be is in the Gospel of John. And as you're turning there, it's the fourth Gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I just want to let you know, we will turn back from there to Matthew as we go through all these, these three lessons this morning. But as you're turning there, the first lesson that I want to make sure we understand before we read this text is Jesus includes even when there are differences and divisions. Jesus includes even when there are differences and divisions. So this morning, the, the text that we're going to look at to, to, to see how he lives this lesson out is found in John chapter 4. To set the stage here, we're not going to, to read the, the very beginning, and I, but I also just want to, to clarify what's going on here is, is the religious leaders are starting to grumble because, John and his, because Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more than John the Baptist and his disciples. And, and what, we could, what we could read in this is that Jesus runs away from this battle. He runs away from this argument. And I just want to remind us, or take us to the place that we understand Jesus doesn't run away. That's not our king. The, the, the man who carries a cross on his shoulders does not run away from a petty argument or a debate. But what he does do is he uses his wisdom and knowledge and understands, hey, I've got mission to do. And so he goes on his way and he leaves the area. So in verse 3, we'll pick up. It says, so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Why, why is this important for us to understand here? Galilee and Judea are split up. They're in two different regions. We understand that. We know what transportation is like. And he has to go through Samaria. This is a big deal that, that we need to start understanding. It says, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. 
Jacob's well was there, and, and Jesus, as, he's tired, as tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me something to drink? Jews and Samaritans did not get along, and this had been a very long uh, hatred and, and animosity uh, between these two. For, for a normal Jewish person who is, who's going to be traveling between these two regions, they would, instead of traveling through Samaria, which you and I would do because we want the quickest route of travel, no matter maybe how boring or, or rugged it may be, we'll, we'll usually take, when we set our GPS, that's the route we're going. No, not these people. The Jews would go around, they, and, and they wouldn't just go a longer route, but they'd also, it'd be more difficult. They'd have to cross the Jordan River, not just once, but twice. Why? Because they didn't want to spend time with the Samaritans simply because it was the, the, this battle that had happened when the, when the two kingdoms were divided and men got involved as God was aligning his plan. They had this anger and hatred and resentment for each other that is much deeper than what we can get into this morning. But Jesus, the, the first thing that we start to see is, is Jesus starts to include when he doesn't go around Samaria. He's willing, when there's division and difference, he's, he's willing to step into it and include even when. But then he meets a Samaritan woman. And he says, will you give me something to drink? Here's the second place that he includes, which is pretty stinking awesome to understand. Not only is a Jew talking to a Samaritan, but a Jewish man is talking to a Samaritan woman. Women at that time were, were less valuable to, to people. They were almost valued as high as an animal. And man, I am glad that that has changed. But it is, it is crazy to think about this woman has to be in her mind just thinking about the, the craziness of this situation. How awesome is it that this guy's talking to me but got lots of questions. And so she's understanding there's this invitation going on and she's wondering. And so she says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Verse 10. And Jesus invites. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And he just opens up the rest of this conversation as it continues to brew and grow. And they talk about this eternal water and this, this spring of life. And they, and they just continue to talk about this conver in this conversation about the riches of this relationship. And Jesus continues to include, that wasn't, that wasn't enough. He wanted more. And so in verse 16, we'll pick up. And he said, he told her, go call your husband and, and have him come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. <laughs> like, I know. Um, when you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're now with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. He's including her. The woman said, she's, and she's starting to respond, I can see you're a prophet. She does not yet know that he's the Messiah, but because of how he's responding, he's willing to cross these lines. She's getting into this, this rhythm of, I want to know more and what's going on. And so in this text, we will end with verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. You see, our king, the one God that we love and serve, he, he isn't willing to walk the line, just walk the line set by the world. No, our, our king, he crosses them. And for those of us in the room, maybe it's not just children and maybe it's not just students. For those of us in the room that like to break the rules, this isn't what we're talking about today. Jesus wasn't a rule breaker. Jesus just didn't follow the line set by the world. If there was difference, if there was division, he didn't walk that line, he crossed it every time. And for that, you and I, no matter where we are this weekend, we can say, thank you. Because as he looked in our lives, he didn't get stuck and say, no, I can't cross that. Instead, he looked at square in the face and he crossed it with a cross. And three days later, an empty tomb. And for that, we're eternally grateful. He didn't hesitate the boundaries that were set up. He wasn't concerned about aligning with them and what other people would say and would this woman respond. How can we be the same? For some of you sitting here this weekend, it might be in a situation where it's the person across the hall from you in your dorm. And you're just trying to figure out, man, I, 
the style of music that they listen to, the, 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 the way they live life, they don't study hard enough, whatever. You can come up with all these things that there's just some solid differences in lines. Are you willing to cross them? Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's within our community and it's that thing of we keep passing by this one individual. God keeps putting them in our life over and over and over again. But there's, this, there's just this line where I'm not so sure I agree with their parenting style. I think if I have them at my house and I try to do life with them and even if we're outside, something's going to break. We've got some pretty strong lines. Or maybe it's a situation that my neighbors are probably wondering right now. Can I really let this guy into my life? I mean, he doesn't mow his yard. He's got kids' toys all over the backyard. I wonder if he's ever going to pick them up. There's not dead grass, but there's mounds that are brown and stacking up from the two barking things next to his garage. I don't know if I'm willing to cross the fence to let this guy into my life. Have you been there? But our king, he says, don't let those lines define invitation. Instead, he includes even when there's differences in division. And we could go on at all the application, the sweetness that comes from that. But let's go on with lesson number two. We're going to turn back to Mark. We're going to skip over Luke, Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. And the second lesson we're going to learn from Jesus this morning uh, is Jesus includes even in the midst of chaos. Jesus includes even in the midst of chaos. As as we look at this text, we just need to identify the geography of where we're at. It says, when Jesus crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, what lake are we talking about here? Because if you read around this text, that language kind of exists. And, And if we don't look hard enough, we just need to identify where we're at. And we're at the Sea of Galilee. And he's been passing back and forth doing ministry. And in verse 22, we can see one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. We've been there. Some of us have probably been there this weekend. It's, you know, it's football season kicking off. It was, either it was Friday night or it was yesterday. Whether we're at our house or we're at a tailgating party, no matter how well our team played or did not play, that doesn't matter. We put ourselves most likely in an environment I mean, where we're pumped up. But even in that space, we just would like a little bit more arm room. And in this scenario, we see, we can read about how Jesus is being pressed upon. And in his mind, he has this mission. He's going to help this little girl. And this crowd is just curious and they're inquisitive. They want to know, they want to see who is this guy they've they've heard about or they've experienced the awesomeness of a relationship that he's building with the people around him. And even if they don't know that he's the real deal yet, they want to observe. They're curious. You and I get that way. We see the flashing lights and we'll go down the street. We hear the music in our neighborhood or down our dorm room or down our dorm hall. We get curious. We'll walk down. And these people are in that place, and they're curious, and they're all pressing around. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She's wanting in. She's heard about him. She's tired of suffering. She's tired of the life that she has to live in this mark that's on her. And she is wanting in. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? (laughs) And this is one of my favorite stories in scripture about Jesus because if he's got this crowd around him, And he's Jesus. There's got to be some things that are going on in his disciples' minds. Seriously? Um, What I just saw you do yesterday, you're asking who touched you? Don't you know all things? I mean, you finish my thoughts. You hear us muttering in the background and, and you question what we're talking about because you don't like it. What do you mean, who touched me? Or they're in this frame of thought like, really? Out of all these people? You were concerned about that one touch? 
We could get there. But the coolness of it is we have also been in this place or we want to be in this place where we're the woman touching. And she now has this invitation. She's been included. She hasn't just received, but now she's being called out because the king of kings wants to talk to her. Puts, puts her in a pretty intimidating position. I mean, this crowd, who, who did it? Verse 31. You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. He stayed consistent. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, pretty proper place, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She was totally included. It was an all-inclusive healing. Not only had she been convicted to touch, but he then drew her in. In the midst of chaos, the God of the universe was willing to pause. He had no concern about the silliness of the question, who touched me? He wasn't worried about what everybody else was gonna say. And he, even in the midst of being on focus to go and heal this young girl, he still stayed on mission and he just allowed himself to redirect it to another individual and heal her. His mission is always to include. It doesn't matter how it shows up. And he stayed on mission. Jesus responds to the reach of one while being pushed by many. Let me repeat that. Jesus responds to the reach of one while being pushed by many. You are most likely here this weekend because of that very truth. Remember that time, and maybe it's right now. You might have been drug in here on the arm of somebody who's saying, you got to go to this church because they're going to preach Jesus, and I want you to know him. Or you're in this place and you're that person who's just so in love and you continue to invite people into this rhythm and this process of knowing Jesus. But we can all go to a place, even if it's right now, where we remember. Remember that chaos we lived in. And we remember that desperate moment with everything that was pushing around us. Not even concerned with what was pushing around our king. And our desperate hand reached out to say, hey, I need you. And we can praise God that he returned the invitation and he invited us in. He didn't call us out in front of the crowd and say, hey, who touched me? Instead, he brought us in and he accepted us and he knew us and he's continued to process this thing we call life with us. I have two daughters, uh, a four-year-old and an 18-month-old, and, and uh, when our first daughter was about two and a half. I was installing a dishwasher in our house uh, for the, uh, the conservation of dry hands and lotion. Um, you know, not just because of the luxury of having a dishwasher. I was really concerned about my wife's hands and how much lotion we we're going to have to buy. Um, so I was, I was a good husband. And uh, so I'm installing this dishwasher, which is a great, it's a great luxury. And, uh, but, but they're very difficult. It's not just plugging them in. And I really hate installing them. Um, but I'm, I'm laying on my stomach in a very tight space trying to do a big task of making sure, I mean, if you don't properly hook up the water line, you're in trouble. And so I'm laying there on my stomach with the headlamp, all in a serious mode, trying to make sure I have enough light and trying to tighten this down, even with these two small hands and that big of a location with tools. It just wasn't working very well. And then you can imagine my frustration. And I'm not just stuck in the chaos of that moment, but I'm also thinking about the things that are yet to come in the project. But I had to help her. A beautiful little two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old girl who wanted to know everything that was going on, who I love very deeply. But I really didn't want her to be around me. And she wasn't just around me, she was actually pretty much on me. <laughs> and so we're laying on the kitchen floor. I mean, it's a beautiful, I'd lay down here to show you, but I'm going to save myself from that. But she lays right up beside me, and she's on my arm as I'm under there and just grunting away trying to get this and frustrated because my hands are not fitting in there and just all this thing. And the question that continued to come out of her mouth in the innocence of a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, curious about what her hero was doing, was this. Daddy, what doing? And I could answer it every time in the kindness of my heart and she continued to ask the question. And so about the fourth time, I lost all kindness. I didn't lose it. You don't need to report me. 
But I did realize, as a, 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 taking the words of Chris Rigg, I maximized my situation. And I understood that I had a beautiful opportunity here to have some fun. No, not really. I had a beautiful opportunity to try to remove the chaos. And so in that situation, I remembered that I'm laying on a linoleum floor. And a two and a half year old is only about 18 pounds. And man, could they slide. And even with my wife standing in the room, shaking her finger at me and not really giving me the body language that I wanted to see, my two and a half year old slid across the floor and made her way into the dining room. (laughs) Fortunately, fortunately, she had a lot more forgiveness and grace than I do today. Not only did she come back, but she came back with tools. (laughs) And the question came again, Daddy, what doing? Church, I'd love to be able to stand before you today and tell you that I've fixed all that problem. But I can tell you from this point, from that one little situation, and remembering the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and how he's worked with me, it's a lot easier today to deal with a four-year-old who's continued to ask those same questions. And now her little sister who's following in, in suit. But what can we learn from this? How do we work this out? Parents, I can't plead with you enough. Even when the going gets tough and your day has been the worst day of your your life up till this point and you walk in the door and that little kid or that teenager meets you. We have to be willing in the point of that chaos, no matter how little their reach is, that they get a chance to see that we as an adult can deal with life and include them into the sweetness of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus. The coworker that you have that has burned you in and out or that is maybe new and you haven't really figured out yet that you don't know if you like or will like. Or maybe the new student in school that you haven't really been able to adjust to or learn their habits or their hobbies or if they have the same interests as you do. And so we, we've, we've kind of got these lines or maybe we, we've maybe been burned a little bit by this. And we've got all these tasks that are before us in our situation of work or our situation of school. We need to be willing in that one reach to not be pushed and subdued to the multitude, but be transformed by the touch of one and respond so that they can see Jesus in us. We need to be willing to pause. We need to be willing to to breathe for, for other people. It might go as far as the situation you're in right now. You might find yourself in the hospital more than you ever dreamt to. In the midst of the chaos about wondering about what tomorrow brings, healing, the the removal of pain, and the process of joy. God's opened up the opportunity for you to be able to pause and respond to the touch of one in the midst of that chaos. So my question for you is, will you? Because you can. Lesson number three. Matthew 14 is where we're going to turn to. The new first, first gospel First book of the New Testament, Matthew 14, 13 through 21. The last lesson that Jesus teaches us in including other people is that he includes even when we lack. This blank is intentional, and it's intentionally small. Don't beat yourself up today where you want to fill in all of your problems, all of your weaknesses, all the places that you want to be better. Allow yourself to be consumed and controlled by the King of Kings and go before him and say, what's that one thing that really needs to change in me? Is it my faith? Is it my purity? Is it my compassion? Is it my energy? Is it my pursuit of of holiness? Is it my hope? What is it, God? Is it my will? What what in me needs to change? Because I know, here's, here's how that conversation needs to go with you, because I know that even in me lacking that and your desire to grow me in that, you still include me. And we're gonna get a chance to see that from his situation with the the disciples as he goes to feed the 5,000. Or the 5,000 come to him and want food. In Matthew 14, uh, just to set the stage here, John the Baptist had just been beheaded, like just been beheaded. This wasn't a big deal just because Jesus was related to John. It was also a big deal because Jesus was John's friend and John was Jesus' friend. But it was bigger than that. John's call to life was to prepare the way of Jesus. And so Jesus had these three big reasons to be in love with John. And John suffers this death by beheaded, being beheaded uh, after he's imprisoned by King Herod. 
And so this is going on in Jesus' heart and mind. And, and when he heard what had happened, in verse 13, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. We, we get that. But guess what happens? On hearing this, the crowds followed him in a, on foot to, from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. He stayed on mo- in, in, in mission. He was ready to continue to include and as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, and here's where we start to see these, these knuckleheads who are lacking something because they've seen all these miraculous signs. They're forgetting the fact that, that Jesus is grieving. And they come to him and they want him to take care of the situation. So lacking compassion and concern and, and, and uh, the willpower to, to, to live out this mindset, this mission mindset, they come and they say this. This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Get them out of here. They kind of cover it up because these people are hungry. But in their own way, they're saying, hey, these people need to eat and we can't do anything about it. Even after all the things we've seen, we want to put the responsibility on you. But Jesus includes. And in, in, in his response, he says this, they do not need to go away. He doesn't say, I will feed them. It says, you get them something to eat. And you probably could have heard the gulp and the pin drop. But the coolest thing that's going on here is, is Jesus has these guys and he's teaching them so much. And he, you give them. I'm going to include you in my power, what I can do. And they respond, remember, Jesus, it's a big deal. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. That's why we're trying to send them away. And Jesus includes again. How awesome is this? He says, bring them to me. You go get them. You go get how we're going to feed these people. You go get them. Bring them to me. And so then they bring them to him, and Jesus gives thanks, and he breaks them. And the disciples distribute them. They distribute. He continues to include them in this. Even when they lacked, Jesus said, I have a plan to utilize you to grow my kingdom. And even better than this, the one thing that most of us hate to do when when the meal is over We want to be the first one to be dismissed or run away from the table because we don't want to clean up. And Jesus right here even teaches them the joy of that. And he says, hey, go pick up the rest. He lets them see what is left over from this great thing that he just did through them, even when they lacked. He took hold of the opportunity. He built up rather than tore down. This is a great response that, uh, that teaches us how to include. This is probably the place that you and I battle the most. Because we've been burned or as we look into people, we see the things that they lack. And sometimes we look at ourselves in the same way. When we look into the mirror, we understand that there's just something that's not right about us. And doggone it, I don't know if I'm good enough anymore for him. I don't know if he's going to want to include me. I don't know if he'll utilize me in his plan to glorify his, and grow his kingdom. I don't know. And we understand today that he's saying now more than ever, absolutely, absolutely I'll include you. But here's the thing, church, we need to be, we need to live that model out the same way. So no matter who we encounter or how we encounter them, take away the lines and the chaos and look at the scenario and see their soul. Don't see that they're lacking in faith or purity or compassion or will. Will. 